Hello and welcome to another episode of Fintech Focus TV with me, Toby Babb. Today I am absolutely delighted to be joined by Oliver Blower from Fortsmart. Oliver, how are you doing? Hey Toby, good to see you. Listen, great. Thanks so much for, uh, for joining us on the show. Um, look, loads of interesting things that we've been talking about before shooting this and it and, uh, sounds like a really interesting time for you and the business. But uh, uh, before we get into that, tell us a little bit about yourself and, 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 uh, and Voxmart itself as well. Yeah, love to. And thanks so much for having me on today. Uh, so yeah, Oliver, Oliver Blower, I guess, uh, you know, 15 years in, in what would now be called fintech. Um, I feel like a bit of a bit of an OG in the space. Um, I remember when it was, <laughs> it used to be called selling software to banks, um, when I started in sort of 2004, five, um, much cooler start- now, much cooler now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've even got the beard. Hey? Uh, I used to be fresh, <laughs> fresh, uh, fresh face, but, uh, that goes with the territory. Um, so I started my career in, as I said, fintech selling software to banks, a company called Triana, which we sold to ICAP in 2007. Um, mm-hmm. That was a, a really exciting uh, growth story, um, uh, market critical infrastructure. I then had the opportunity to go and work with Barclays and Bank of America in their fixed income trading business um, during sort of 2010 and the after effects and ripple effects of, of the 2008 crash. Um, Met some great people, uh, worked with some fascinating products and, and business lines and technology. Um, and then I had the opportunity to meet Voxmart in 2014, um, initially actually as an investor. And uh, there was something really quite interesting in Voxmart. Voxmart were the very first provider of mobile voice recording in the UK market. When in 2011, people like myself suddenly had to have their Blackberries recorded. You know, some, some, someone from compliance came in and said, Hey, we need your BlackBerry. Why? We've got to put this recording technology on it. Okay. Um, you know, like all sort of nascent early stage tech, the, the user experience was, was horrible and nobody used it. Um, and then obviously fast forward sort of four years and I met the technology provider that did it. And I thought there was something really interesting because it, it had a platform to enable change, seeing those key ingredients like vision and mission and and purpose and, and capital and, and uh, technology, et cetera. Um, and it, it sort of matched with a thesis that I, that I had when I was in the bank, which was, you know, big banks and big financial market markets firms, they kind of do mobile really, really badly, right? It's a bit like the Wild West films when you come to the saloon and you leave your gun at the door and then you come in. It's a bit like that with your mobile phone. You know, you do everything on this device, you know, bank, shop, you know, Amazon, et cetera. And then, you know, you just sort of put that in a locker outside the trading floor and then you come to work. And there was just a complete mismatch. And I thought, well, that's crazy. So I started asking questions about why. And it turned out that the, the sort of compliance infrastructure that existed on the desk, you know, with the turrets and the Bloomberg, that just didn't translate to, to mobile and it wasn't future proofed in any scalable way. So I sort of matched that with this company I just met with called Voxmart, and I thought there's something really interesting here. Um, mm-hmm. And that's really where we began the journey. And what we've been doing ever since is, is just been building our business uh, with market participants and, and working together, first around voice, then we added SMS. And four years ago, we added WhatsApp and WeChat, and we're about to add some exciting new channels. And we've just been, you know, what we've seen uh, is just a huge explosion in usage and, and a complete change in the way people work. You know, gone are the days of, you know, old fashioned sort of two phones broking a deal. It, it may start on WhatsApp, it may move to a conversation, it may then execute over Bloomberg or email. And communication is just completely democratized as it has in our consumer lives, right? Um, yeah, yeah. It, that, that has infiltrated markets. And Voxmart's been right there enabling that change for market participants. Um, and as I say, it's been, it's been a fantastic journey. Um, you know, if I think what we've achieved in five years, you know, tens of thousands of users, hundreds of customers, over a hundred people in the organization, four offices globally, which gives us a great opportunity to move around and talk to market participants from Malaysia to Toronto, from, you know, South America to Central Europe. It's just been, it's been hugely exciting. I think it's a really interesting uh, sort, of, sort of period as well now for, for technology such as yours, because, you know, that journey over five years has been really interesting. But right now you're, pr- you're probably looking at something which has seen a, 
you know, uh, and and the, th the you know the theme of all of these interviews has been sort of taking the, the positives from the negative. And I know it's difficult sometimes to to remain empathetic with a, you know, such a human situation. But I imagine there's been a, a sort of surge over over um, recent weeks as well for the product, right? Oh God, gotcha. yeah. I mean, look, um, you know, if you zoom out, right? Um, coronavirus, COVID nineteen was was the black swan of twenty twenty, right? Mm. Possibly even even the sort of decade, um, and you know, it's decimated other industries, you know, aviation, tourism, um, you know, traditional sort of consumer retail, right? But yeah. when you look at fintech and financial services more broadly, um, you know, you see, you see not only has it survived, it, it's flourished. And, mm. uh, you know, a good friend of mine, Mark Beeston at Illuminate said that, mm. you know, it, it's been an accelerant for fintech. I, and I think he's absolutely right. Um, the for us, on the fire, he called it, didn't he? Absolutely right, and, yeah. and he's right. Um, and and what would have taken three to five years, you know, in that sort of uh, adoption life cycle and you know hard work of innovation, has taken three months, right? Mm. For firms to suddenly adopt the technology. For us specifically, we've seen we've seen two things, right? One is just a huge explosion in, in the um, purchasing of the technology and the need for the technology. And the second thing is the usage of the technology, right? Because mm -hmm. if, if you think what we do more, you know, broadly, we, we capture uh, communications and we, and we surveil those communications, but a large portion of our business is still mobile. Uh, mm -hmm. Mobile pre-COVID was still a sort of ad hoc tool that people used when they were off the desk or out the office or traveling um, post COVID it's enterprise critical, right? Usage of mobile on our platform went up a thousand percent in 48 mm -hmm. hours, right? Yeah. Usage of WhatsApp, WeChat went up hundreds of, of percent. It was already quite high because already that trend had, <coughs> had sort of really began to entrench. Um, and so less so, but you suddenly realize that mobile devices have become the business continuity disaster recovery of the future of a post pandemic world. I mean, I remember when I was at Bank of America, our disaster recovery plan was centered around an attack on the building, whether it be cyber or physical. And we had a DR site in Bromley that we would all move to, right, where our desks were replicated. Now, you can't do that in a pandemic when people don't want to get on the tube, they don't want to get on the train, you know, wives and husbands and children are saying, mummy, daddy, I don't want you to go to the office. I want you to stay at home. We have to isolate. Right. So, so how do you engineer a, a compliant solution when you can't go to an office? And so mm -hmm. technology like ours became enterprise critical or mission critical overnight. And, mm -hmm. and what would have taken, three to five years to happen happened in in literally a matter of days so yeah. you know incredibly fortunate um in, incredibly uh, fortuitous and it's it's not just happened to us it's happened to many of our peers in reg tech and fintech right yeah absolutely absolutely and that's a message that we've been getting time and time again you know i'm, I'm speaking to people all the way through this and and uh you know, there's 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 people who've you know grown by 300 percent uh, over the course of the pan pandemic, it's, and it's uh, you know it's it's been brilliant to see uh, you know such a negative thing have such a positive impact for for the industry in terms of how it's able to you know adapt and 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 accelerate some of these issues. I spoke to Mark; he you know his his show was on last week, and uh, uh, you know very very much a, a similar you know, sort of message in that. And I think. Um, I yeah, even speak. I know that that uh, you know Brian Hunt's a, a friend of yours as well, who's saying similar sort of things happening with uh, Cloud Nine and what they're doing. It's it's a very very interesting space. But again, with that with that accelerated usage, that accelerated uptake, there's enormous pressures that come around that as well, right? You've got to uh, adapt to a business that's oh. used to significant more volumes. Tell us how you've dealt with that. Yeah. So you know we were on a growth trajectory anyway, right? We were on a, a very uh, ambitious growth trajectory um, pre-COVID. So, you know, January, February, we were thinking about how to grow our business. Um, if if I frame it in in the following way, right? And um, there was a really interesting article um, by Sequoia, uh, who who in, immediately as COVID hit, they issued a note to their CEOs and founders, and they they said, look, three things three things are going to happen, right? 
Number one, you're going to see a drop in business activity. Number two, you're going to see a huge disruption to the supply chain, both existing and new customers. And number three, you're going to have cancelled meetings and travel restrictions left, right and centre. Right. So three big things. And then they said, okay, how do you prepare for that, right? And, and we took this, by the way, as our, as our blueprint, right? Just to sort of talk you through some of the things that we've done, which no doubt Brian and, and others have done. Um, the first one is, is cash, right? Um, most fintechs are pretty thinly capitalized, um, unless they have SoftBank as an investor. Um, they're, they're pretty thinly capitalized, and they, and they capitalize for growth by, um, with milestones, right? They, they grow their business. They raise more money at a higher valuation and make sure they maximize shareholder value. But it means that on a balance sheet basis, they're quite thinly capitalized. Um, um, and so you've got to look at your cash runway. And what the advice from Sequoia was, was make sure you've got six to 12 months runway, right? <laughs> which, mm. for most, which for most fintechs is an absolute luxury. Most, most of us have three, three months maximum, right? Um, yeah. And we sort of grow our way out of, of the problem. Um, but that was the first thing we looked at was, was cash. And we were unbelievably lucky um, to, to be in negotiation with, with NatWest um, and the guys at NatWest who, who supported us with, uh, with, a, with a debt round in, in March. And we closed that on the 24th of March, right as the pandemic was biting. And if there's, if there's one sort of uh, data point which, which would suggest that we had someone sort of looking after us, I think that was it, right? And yeah, yeah. I think this goes as a sort of line item on my CV to say, I, I closed the debt round during a global pandemic. Um, <laughs> timing's everything. Timing's everything, right? Mm -hmm. and, and they were unbelievably supportive. They knew what was going on and you know, they knew that we could uh, grow through it and grow out of it. So that, you know, that gave us a huge amount of comfort that we could support our business going forward. Uh, and we've been very fortunate uh, not to have to rely on any government um, support network. So we, we haven't tapped into any of the loans. We haven't used furlough. We haven't terminated anybody or, you know, had to go through redundancies. So we've been unbelievably uh, fortunate and, and cautious by managing that cash, cash runway. The, yeah. the second one is, you know, we reevaluated our overall capital strategy. We were as a result of an acquisition we did last year, we were raising funding to pay for it, but then we were raising growth funding once we had integrated those two businesses and we understood what the potential looked like. And an equity fundraise during a global pandemic is, is as, as I'm sure you know from your, your other conversations, a little bit challenging. So yeah. we decided just to delay that a little bit and I'm I'm, I'm pretty pleased that we're, we're very close to closing that now, actually, um, some well sort done. of two to three months out. So we, we pushed that out um, somewhat conservatively. Um, the third one was um, our sales forecasts. Um, given that being fintech, by definition, we sell to banks and brokers and large financial services firms, all of them go into, they go into almost like decision paralysis on, on, on acquiring net new technology. If, unless you're an existing vendor, the idea that a big bank is going to onboard you during a pandemic is, is, um, you know, is optimistic. Um, mm. So we pushed out a lot of our anticipated sales processes, which I'm also pleased to, pleased to say have come back in again, because mm. quite quickly, once they got their houses in order through March, April, they started thinking, okay, let's, let's kind of go back to BAU now that we're all you know, comfortable and safe and secure, and those projects have come back in, but immediately we pushed them out. Um, and some of those procurement processes seem to have accelerated a little bit from what I'm hearing as well. Absolutely, right? Absolutely, yeah. because, you know, if you think about what's happened, you know, let's say you're a big bank anyway, right? You've got probably four or six global trading hubs around the world. Mm -hmm. um, you've now got that times the number of staff you've got because everybody's at home so everybody's home office or front room or living room becomes a trading hub and so that problem and complexity is just uh, just just increased infinitum right so mm. suddenly you've got to look at technology like ours to make sure that it's compliant and secure and safe and you know your the regulators are, are keen to understand how you're doing that 
So we've been working with market participants to get them get them set up. Um, so yeah, a huge preparatory effort to make sure that they're they're prepared. Um, the fourth point um, that a lot of fintechs have, have been looking at is is marketing, right? Because the the first inclination is to just completely shut down marketing spend on on the basis of you know nobody's going to listen to my messaging or or hear my voice during a pandemic because I've got other priorities. We actually took a different view and said, mm. with everybody at home, the focus is going to increase because we don't have the distraction of coffee breaks and intermittent meetings, etc. And we're actually going to have a much more focused audience. And mm. so we increased our lead generation, our you know, pay, paid advertising, um, and that's had a huge effect on inbound interest in the technology, which has been great. You know, one thing we, we did do is, is we looked at headcount and, and we, we put in place a, a headcount freeze, which mm -hmm. we're just coming out of now. But that was a very sort of cautious, prudent thing to do. The first thing we said is, you know, like a family, we don't want yeah. to have to lose anybody, right? Um, yeah. So we didn't furlough. We didn't um, make any redundancies. We didn't rely on any government support because we had the right capital strategy. Um, but what that meant, to, to your point, is... We're now creaking at the seams, um, a mm. lot like other, other fintechs. And so we're now looking at, okay, how aligned with our capital strategy do we start to reintroduce hiring? Because there's, there's some phenomenal talent out there. Um, Absolutely. You know, one thing that happens in these sorts of market shocks is you know, assets become incredibly keenly priced and, and, and amazing talent um, presents itself. Um, because unfortunately... You know what we said earlier about all these other industries being decimated you've got some incredibly talented people suddenly coming onto the job market so those yeah. are some of the things that we've sort of worked through um, and hopefully that gives a little bit of color on how we've um, tried to run our business during this pandemic yeah i think there's there's a, there's a lot of incredibly prudent things in there that the the uh... Uh, there's there's a number of people I've spoken to who've, who've uh, you know we're, we're in uh, the last phases of uh, you know of raising capital at, at various stages through, throughout all of this and uh, I think there was that you know that, that Sequoia thing was really notable wasn't it because it suddenly froze everyone when it came out mm. and it was very very heavily publicised and in many ways you know the more cynical amongst us could probably look at it and say it was a good way of them. Uh, um, getting a better deals on some of the business <laughs> that they were, they were looking well, of at. Of course it was, right? <laughs> to, to, There's a reason why they're the best investor on the planet. <laughs> exactly, exactly right, exactly right. But they put that at those comms out and it froze a little bit of, uh, you know, created a bit, a bit of fear. What's happened subsequently is people have recognized just how much opportunity I think that there is that, that comes out from this, from, you know, a lot of what Mark says about the, um, uh, you know, the acceleration over, over you know, over recent years, and uh, sorry, recent months of digital transformation, huge, huge opportunities within it. And suddenly banks adopting to, you know, to new technology, that sort of, um, uh, you know, that sort of prudence, I think of making sure that you're there and your team's in, in place has, has been important. And obviously a new way of working for everyone mm. you know, around it. Tell, well, tell me about the, 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 the future of the business and you know, with this uptick and with everything that's sort of moving in there, you know, there's, there's, you know, we're now talking uh, sort of early to mid July, um, and this will mm -hmm. probably go out in, in I would imagine early early August, but early to mid July, we're talking about you know uh, companies slowly starting to return to offices, and but still not a huge amount of confidence about people doing that. Tell us about mm -hmm. the sort of repatriation of your of, of your offices and what that means for your space. Tell us, uh, I know you're you've been someone who's you mentioned there about the marketing side, which has been so so important. Every business that's done really well. I think took that opportunity to recognize why right, it's time to move up marketing rather than down. But within, within that as well, it's to replace things like trade shows where we haven't have been able to, to meet people. I know that's been an issue for people. I know you're a big networker and, and get out there and, uh, uh, and meeting clients and, and contacts and putting people together. Has that been replaced? And what, what do you think that will look like moving forward as well? So about 15 questions for you there to throw on, grab them and run with them. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, okay, let's sort of starting at the beginning, right? Um, we we started an equity fundraise. So by the time this comes out, sort of early or mid August, we would have announced our, our Series B fundraise, and we've been incredibly fortunate to be able to close that during a pandemic. But what's interesting is we spoke to fifty of the, of the world's largest sort of you know B two B SaaS enterprise fintech investors, all of whom were doing deals. So they were all open for business. They were all um, 
you know, interested in doing deals and, and there was evidence that they were doing deals. Um, what we did see, however, that there was um, some, some downward pressure on valuations as a result of people reforecasting and remodeling their business, often surprised to the upside, like we were, right? Mm. So we were surprised to the upside. Um, fast forward then to the latter part of the question about this sort of re-entry into, into work, or still being in growth mode, the, um, you know, in an ideal world, we'd get straight back to the office, return to normal, and, and just go for it, right? Pedal to the metal. Um, but actually, what's, um, what's come through, through surveys and town halls and open communication with the team, is people don't want to do that, right? Um, mm. a, a, there's still a little bit of anxiety and fear, understandably so. Um, but two, there's a realization that they're actually pretty productive and pretty happy um, remote working. Um, and what they like to have is a sort of hybrid model, right? So mm. they work two or three days at home, but they've also got an office space to come to one or two days a week when they want to socialize with their colleagues, when they want to do networking, when they want to do client meetings or client lunches and dinners, which, which is the bit that I missed the most. Um, and so, what we've actually done is we had a really big space in Shoreditch, 55, 60 people, massive sort of third floor, our own meeting rooms, um, bathrooms, kitchens. That sat empty for three months, right? Mm. Um, and, and one or two people have been using it just as a break from sitting in their bedroom or their kitchen or a, a, break, from, a break from the kids or whatever. Uh, but that's a lot of money to pay for, for one or two people. So we've actually reduced uh, or we're in the process of reducing our London presence to a space that is more flexible, mm. um, allows for social distancing. So a lot more room between individuals, between desks. We can accommodate up to 25, 30 people, which is about a third of our UK presence. And we think that's going to be perfect for the next year because it's going to enable the development team to go in on a Monday uh, and, mm. and whiteboard and, and um, do their scrums and their steer coats. For the sales team to go in on a Tuesday, for the marketing team to go on a Wednesday, for the management team to meet, for the board to meet, etc. Mm. So we, we, want, we're, we want flexibility over size. Um, mm. And we're obviously majoring on security and um, you know, security, both sort of physical and mental, because people are still quite cautious. But yeah. in London specifically, I think the the sensitivity is not so much the office space. The sensitivity is the travel, right? Unless yeah. you live a walk or a bike ride away from the office, you don't want to get on a tube. You don't want to get on a train. Um, Uber is is obviously a, an expensive mechanism. So we think the next year will very much look like people coming in as and when they want to, as and when their teams and their, their functions meet, and as and when they want to catch up with colleagues or you know, industry sort of uh, colleagues. Um, and, and that's how we're gonna structure uh, the London presence over the next year. Uh, Madrid, where we have a, a big team, um, they, they, they're sort of, their re-entry is a little bit um, earlier than ours because obviously mm. they, they they got hit hard earlier. Um, somewhat fortuitously, we had just taken a new space, so that's made available. It's brand new, very clean, um, plenty of room between desks. So that looks like people are starting to go back, but tentative, um, you know, small steps. We're very supportive, very relaxed. Um, it hasn't had any material impact on productivity in fact the opposite is probably true we've been more productive um, mm. what has set in and i'm sure you hear this a lot is this kind of covid19 fatigue right the monotony of another day sat staring at myself in my office right uh, all i want to do is meet a buddy for a beer or go yeah. go for lunch or you know go to a conference all these things that became monotonous previously and now, you know, being sort of Pining yearned up. for. So, <laughs> yeah, we're we're going to be we're going to be super flexible, um, and certainly not hurry back to jamming everybody in an office again.
Yeah. And do you think, I mean, that you, you mentioned for the next year, f- further on from that, do you see it returning to the sort of BAU of, uh, of everyone in the office and a little bit, or do you, or do you see this as, as a new, as a new dawn for, uh, for office work full stop? I mean, there, there's definitely a view that, that I probably subscribe to, which is this sort of hybrid working is, is going to be, is going to be the new normal, right? In mm. this ultimate flexibility. I mean, it's, it, it's forced people like myself. I was never a work from home guy, right? Um, mm. For 15 years, I was a, you know, get on the 5 a.m. train, be in the office for 7, 7.30, do my 12 hours and then come home, mm. right? Um, even in technology banking and then technology again, that was that was the the lifestyle you know usually yeah. there would be a, a breakfast a lunch or a dinner or an event or something in there um so this is the first time i've operated kind of exclusively remotely and given the tools that are now available to us zoom teams slack hangouts etc it's made it super easy right mm. and i now get to take my kids to school and pick them up for the school when they are in school um yeah I get, I get to do all these things. I don't miss the commute, right? I don't miss the two and a half hours of my day where I sat on a train half asleep, um, yeah, yeah. surrounded yeah. by sort of zombies doing the same thing. Um, so I think actually this is going to force us a very quick, you know, whereas previously it may have taken, you know, three, five, ten years to, to change. It's forced us all to completely rethink the way that we work. Um, yeah. And so I, I definitely subscribe to the view that this is, this is the new normal. Um, and I think, you know, I think we're all going to be better off for it mentally and physically. Absolutely. And what, and what about the, the, the rest of the business? What else do you think will be some of the things that you, you take from this as a, as a positive legacy moving further forward? So I think one thing that's happened, which is quite interesting, is what the, what the pandemic has, has forced our bigger customers to do is is focus on working with their existing partners first. Um, in years gone by, they had the luxury of near infinite resource. So if they had a problem, they go out and solve it with a tactical solution. And you find they've got, you know, before they know it, they've got hundreds of vendors that they're managing. What we're seeing and hearing uh, from our big customers is, you know, we want to work with you, Voxmart, on exploring other use cases, right? So we've had a huge number of really, really exciting and interesting conversations that take us slightly away from our sort of our norm, but actually are really, really exciting opportunities for the business. And, you know, I, I talk to other fintech CEOs regularly and they're finding exactly the same thing. Now, that can work against you when you're not an incumbent vendor and, and you're frustrated on the sidelines because you know you can help. Um, yeah. But where you are, an existing vendor, it's it's a great opportunity to to iterate. Um, you know, we we did an acquisition last year. We're really excited about working um, with some strategic partners this year to begin to think about that consolidation. Uh, as we as we sort of think about the the sort of life cycle, innovation, disruption, fragmentation, then leads to consolidation and industrialization. Without to, without overloading viewers on on americanisms um (laughs) is a yeah but um that trend um is happening and and we you know we because we feel you know we serve the markets but we're quite unique in that most of the senior management team in fact all of them at senior management team and a lot of the people in the company they come from the customers that we now serve right so we really understand the problems we're solving the use cases and we feel you know really um connected to our customers and therefore excited about helping them with that consolidation, um, you know, removing regulatory risk and removing operational risk and, and really iterating and exploring. So I think, you know, that's something that, you know, is, is net new to us that, that wasn't there pre-COVID um, because pre-COVID it was, you know, we've got problem A, go out and find a vendor that can solve problem A and usually mm-hmm. pick the best one you know, to now we have problem A, go to all of our existing vendors and figure out which one would be best at solving that problem. And, yeah. you know, we, we love that. That's been fascinating. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a very um, interesting sort of opportunity. You used the word iterate, and, and I love, you know, iterative improvement, I think, all the way, all the way through. There's a lot of, uh, 
you know, iterative change out there that I think is going to have a really positive impact to businesses such as yours. And there's so much value that companies like yours can can add to businesses at the moment. Who should be reaching out to you? Who's who who are you going to be really useful for? Who do you think you can you can solve problems for right now? And how should they do that? Look, I think it's you know anybody that has uh, a markets business. I mean, if we think about how we've built our business, um, we're specifically within sort of capital markets, sales mm -hmm. and trading. We're starting to explore wealth and retail and private banking. But anybody that's think, thinking in a big organization, and, I, and the reason I say big organization and not necessarily financial organization, is because we've seen interest from pharmaceutical legal. Because what's been super interesting is now that everybody's at home, how do you know what they're all doing, right? How do mm. you know that they're compliant? And you know, we think about what we do as, as helping individuals protect themselves you know, this isn't technology that is used against you. This is technology that can help you defend yourself to, you know, I didn't do that, or this is what I was actually doing. And this is the context. So, you know, who should reach out to us is any, anybody who's thinking about the future of how they communicate, how they can enable communication in a secure and compliant way. And, and then the, the sort of data that can come from those communications. I mean, our vision has always been, we want to help capital markets but businesses more broadly understand the value of their communications data that that's our sort of vision because we our experience is all of this data is going into the ether and not being leveraged and capitalized and used and my god it's valuable and fascinating and useful so anybody that's thinking about their data strategy anybody that's thinking about how do they mobilize their teams how do they communicate in this new world um, should, should come talk to us. I mean, traditionally, we, we liaise with COOs of markets, heads of markets, people that are thinking about the future of their business. And perhaps that conversation has accelerated, you know, given what's happened. Absolutely. And how best should they do that? What's the, what's the best contact to, uh, to get in touch with you, Oliver? I mean, they can come to me. They can reach out to any of the team. They can hit the website at voxsmart.com. Uh, all of our contact details are on there globally. Um, so we are 100% open for business and, and, and looking forward to having any conversation. Um, we, we've had some weird and wonderful conversations, <laughs> but some, some fabulously fascinating conversations. And we can't wait to have more of the same with uh, market participants. Well, I'm going to follow this in the uh, the fascinating and wonderful uh, under the conversations that I've had during this. It's been a it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Thanks so much for sharing uh, your story. I think you guys have done a great job all the way through this from everything everything I'm hearing, and uh, I'm I'm here, glad, so glad to hear that the business is doing well and and that uh, you're, uh, you're 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 thriving through all of this uh, this chaos that's going around us. Oliver, thank you so much uh, awesome. for for sharing the story. It's been great talking to really you. Really appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Thank you all for watching. We'll see you soon on another episode of FinTech Focus TV. Thanks a lot.